This video is sponsored by Kemp Flowmon, a network intelligence tool capable of advanced monitoring and threat detection. More information about my thoughts on Kemp Flowmon's advanced monitoring and prevention offerings in a few moments. You open up your computer to find this screen in front of you. Yes, indeed, ransomware. You've heard about it, you've seen it, it's a security nightmare, and well, it sustains itself in a very profitable, vicious cycle. But do you know how ransomware propagates? What steps it takes to get started within the process before you get to a screen like the one in front of me? In today's video topic, I will be investigating exactly this question. The general steps ransomware takes to a compromised computer and network. Right now I'm in an isolated environment via a virtual machine, as you can see in front of me. I have this ransomware strain from an open source project which contains a whole bunch of malware. It's a GitHub repository called the Zoo, there's a link in the description below. Now of course this is made for educational purposes and this malware is very much so live, so don't do this on your regular machine. I'm using the Server Ransomware variant, which is a relatively older ransomware strain. Server was one of the two ransomware operations at the time, which pioneered what we now know as the new monetization model, ransomware as a service. So the machine is now infected, as you can display here with the ransomware note. What the heck happened and how did we get to this state? Well, there's obviously many scenarios this can happen, and I'm just going to be walking through some of the general techniques threat actors will use to get, well, this right here in front of you. It all starts with performing some basic reconnaissance or discovery on the initial target. So it could start with a simple Google search, maybe looking at the company's front end website, looking at the employees, the C-suite of level of executives, and what they do. Social media accounts and public records are good ways to understand what the company is doing in any given day. So many different ways, but the first thing to do is just gather your information and discovery on the business, what they do. Most commonly, attackers are gonna take the path of least resistance because, well, laziness. So they will probably try the easiest methods first and then go up the chain from there. And this usually is in the form of social engineering. Social engineering is a factor that can't be minimized. Social engineering is usually through the form of what you've known probably by now is a phishing email. About 78% ransomware attacks starts out with a phishing email, such as this one right here. Here I have a seemingly harmless email with an attachment included. In a real world environment, absent of my humor, thank goodness, you would find that a email contains some document or maybe some important information leading to a website for more detail on what's going on. Maybe it's an attachment representing a banking information statement or updating the billing info of an employee, or it's an urgent email from a CEO causing that sense of urgency or anything that really truly relates to business and yeah personal environment as well here in this email as an example we receive a phishing statement talking about how we need to go ahead and update our information for a vendor management company and as you can see there is an updated billing info dot document which in this case will probably include something malicious such as a macro which leads us into the next exact situation. So let's say this user is tricked into updating the billing information, in this case for a vendor management company, clicks the download button, and saves the file. The attachment could include a common file type such as a PDF with a backdoor, maybe a Word document with an embedded macro in this case, or an executable that looks like it's a legitimate software program. It could also leverage the power of a command interpreter such as PowerShell or Windows Command Prompt, which will supply a list of commands to run in the background via PowerShell or Windows Command Prompt, and that will query for a payload to be downloaded. Perhaps it's through the use of a JavaScript, a Python, or an RDB connection to server. There are many tactics used to achieve execution, and the goal is to execute the payload. Now, the payload itself may not be ransomware or malware. It could be an exploitation technique used to gain further foothold inside a network. Further communication and connection 
may occur down in the chain and oftentimes will. So this leads us into the next step of, well, a compromised network. So after the payload has been executed, it's time to perform some additional discovery, establish persistence, and get a backdoor with elevated privileges into the network. Network discovery allows an attacker to understand more about the environment that they are in. The attacker will likely collect information on hosts and network data. Attackers will likely use built-in native commands such as the net command on the command prompt. In this case, with the net command, you can get a list of users, groups, hosts, and files. You can also query Active Directory if they're within a domain. Network scanning and enumeration gives attackers the visibility into network topology, the host operating systems, and the possible vulnerabilities that these hosts may be uh, you know, subject to. Next is persistence. Persistence allows an attacker to gain a continuous foothold inside a network. In the case that the attacker were to lose the first initial way of access, they could get into the network from a different way. The attacker may establish persistence through creating additional computer user accounts that maybe look very similar to other accounts, DLL hijacking, abusing the Windows registry system, or using a web shell. This is an example of just a few ways that they will do this. Once persistence has been established, it's time to escalate those privileges and move laterally across the network. This step may coincide with the discovery phase depending on the priority. Privilege escalation can be achieved through credential dumping, bypassing user access controls, process injection, exploiting a known vulnerability, and there's many more tactics, of course. The overall goal is to achieve domain admin or system level privileges, which is the highest privilege account in a Windows domain system. The next step is to establish a communication line with a set of computers on the network to connect back to an attacker controlled command and control server or C2 server. Attackers will try to mimic normal traffic activity and avoid detection controls. The purpose of a command and control or C2 server is to exfiltrate sensitive data and send further instructions uh, to the victim computers. Now, a C2 server will commonly be used to establish this connection, and traffic can be impersonated on the application layer protocol, such as DNS, email protocols, data streaming. Once a communication line has been set up, it's finally trying to exfiltrate data. It's been more of a novel or newer technique within the past couple of years, where they will exfiltrate the data first, to blackmail the victim into paying the ransom. Now, this is where the actual ransomware executable or payload can be sent through. Once the attacker has accomplished all of these steps, you will see the screen that we started with in the beginning of the video, a ransomware note. Oftentimes, they will have a little file or HTML document saying, hey, this is where you can get your decryption key. You have to send Bitcoin to this address. As you can see, the files are now encrypted. This is a sample file on my desktop here. Ransomware deployments can occur from scheduled tasks. They could be from scripted deployments, GPO policy implementation updates. Really depends on the attacker's technical you know, ability and what they want to do. These are just a few examples of how ransomware has been deployed in the past. And there you have it. The computer has been compromised and you can only hope that the company has sufficient backups and that the data has not been exfiltrated by the attackers before deploying the ransomware. As you can see, many companies fall victim to attacks like these in any given week and month. So what happens now? Three words, prevention, detection, and recovery. And then you also have education and there's also other strategies. Strategies can be implemented through policy, awareness, and effectively being handled by a security. Team. There are strategies, technologies, tools, and frameworks anywhere from endpoint detection response to implementing email gateways. There are so many different tools an enterprise or company has in today's environment. So today I want to talk about one particular technology and that is called Network Detection Response or NDR. Network Detection Response is a solution which continuously monitors and analyzes raw enterprise traffic. When suspicious activity or normal traffic patterns deviate from the norm, 
an NDR tool will alert the security teams of the potential threats within their environment. So backtracking to the previous scenario that we went through, an NDR tool would be able to analyze network traffic patterns and alert on any suspicious activity going on. And I'm gonna go ahead and break this down very quickly. I'm gonna go ahead and use a tool as an example. And in this case, it is today's sponsor. And you may be thinking you're just promoting some random tool um, and that's really it. But ultimately, Kemp Flowmon is a great example of a network detection response technology out there. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of each of the steps. And I'm gonna be using this tool as an example. When it comes to reconnaissance and discovery, the first phase of ransomware, Flowmon detects enumeration in active neighbor hosts on the network. And it performs detection scans against discover targets. Then step two, when the attacker is looking for initial access, maybe the attacker is trying to break a password within an account. Well, Kemp Flowmon can detect brute forcing techniques on those users' credentials and report that to the proper team. Then when you get into execution, an attacker maybe is exploiting RDP credentials as we talked about. Flowmon detects the use of RDP credentials. But it also can detect other installations of a malicious software such as key loggers, or even the connection to a C2 server. When it comes to the discovery, persistence, and privilege escalation phase, what's gonna happen next is the attacker is going to split data into smaller chunks to simulate what a normal corporate network traffic would look like, right? Well, they may be doing that through splitting up ICMP traffic using the proper encryption. Flowmon can detect high amounts of data transfer. This is a critical step, and Flowmon can actually show uh, what is going outside your network. When it comes to those command and control servers, C2 servers and these connections, Flowmon can detect botnet commands and uh, the commands that are sent to the C2 server. Finally, when the attacker deploys the ransomware uh, and the attacker is encrypting the information, as we saw in the beginning of the video, Flowmon can detect network activity, which in this case would be high amounts of encryption and alert the proper security team. And throughout each of those steps, a tool such as an NDR tool, Kemp Flowmon, can help you prevent, detect, recover, and respond against those attacks within the chain. So that is the steps of a prolific ransomware variant. So I appreciate Kev Flomon for sponsoring today's video. I also hope that you've learned something new about the steps that it takes for a ransomware variant to go through and compromise a network so that they can get a sufficient amount of data out and then they can encrypt your files. So thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed, that's all I care to really ask for. And yes, until the next video, have a good day.